Ciao! Welcome to a new lesson. Today we talk about the best lenses for food photography. Ready? Let's start! So this is one of the million dollar questions. What's the best lens for food photography? So let's find out. Choosing the right lens is crucial. Luckily, in food photography, there are only a handful of lenses to choose from and you don't have to invest a fortune in the beginning. Some of the best food photography lenses are the cheapest lenses. Hooray! <laughs> so that's great news. Um, I have three examples here. Each of these image, uh, images were shot with a different lens. The, the beautiful soups were shot with a 35 millimeter lens. The middle one of the scone and the afternoon tea was shot with a 50 millimeter lens. And the beautiful close-up of the macarons was shot with a 100 millimeter macro lens. So let's have a look at each of these and what the difference is and what they do, basically. So what do those numbers mean? <laughs> basically, the numbers describe and indicate the focal length. And the focal length describes the angle of view. So how wide or how small the angle of view is. So the smaller the number, the wider the, the angle of view. So a wide angle, meaning you can see a lot in your scene, um, is generally anything below 35 millimeters. So if you have a 12 millimeter, 24 millimeter, or 35 millimeter, those are considered wide angle lenses, meaning they can capture a wider scene. Standard lenses um, are anything between 50 to 70 millimeters. Now, why do we say standard? Because those focal lens kind of represent almost the same angle of view as the human eye. So that's why they're called standard lenses. Because if you use a 50 millimeter or a 70 millimeter, roughly your angle of view will be the same as your naked eye. Telephoto lenses are all the focal lens above 70 millimeters. So 70, 80, 100, 200. And then obviously if, you, if you're shooting uh, wildlife photography, then maybe you have like 600 or 800. Those are crazy. Those huge lenses that look like cannons. <laughs> Those are extreme telephoto lenses. <laughs> But generally in food photography, anything around the 80, 90 or 100, it's considered a telephoto lens. Now, there are macro lenses. Macro lenses can be standard or telephoto lenses. So you might normally see macro lenses um, like 60, 60 millimeter, 90 millimeter or 100 millimeter or 105 millimeter macro. Macro doesn't really describe the focal length. Macro just tells you how close you can be to the subject for the camera to still be able to focus. So the minimum focal distance describes how close your lens can be to your subject for your camera to be able to focus. Some lenses have, let's say, a focal, a minimum focal distance of I don't know, 50 centimeters, right? So if you are 50 centimeters or further away from your subject, then your camera can focus, no problem. If you go closer to your subject than 50 centimeters, then your camera will not be able to focus, okay? While a macro lens generally has a much, much shorter minimum focal distance, meaning you can be like really close to your subject and your camera will still be able to focus. Now, when we talk about lenses, it's very important to distinguish between a full frame camera versus a cropped sensor camera. Why is that important? Because some lenses are made for full frame and some lenses are made for cropped sensors. These are also interchangeable sometimes, um, but let's see what the main difference is. The main difference between a full frame and a cropped sensor is that a full frame will have often a 35 millimeter long sensor. Like literally the sensor is physically 35 millimeters long. And this is from the old film cameras. A cropped sensor is physically smaller. 
meaning every pixel in the sensor is smaller and the sensor itself, the whole sensor is smaller than a full frame camera. And what does it mean in terms of lenses? A lens that has a 35 millimeter angle on a full frame camera. So if we take this photo, for example, this was shot with a 35 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. My 35 millimeter lens will give me a, an angle of view that is much wider than if this was shot with a 35 millimeter lens on a cropped sensor, because the sensor of the cropped sensor camera is literally ends where the red line is. So if I was shooting this image with a cropped sensor camera, my camera would only see whatever is inside the red rectangle, while a full frame sees everything else, everything that else that's outside of the red rectangle as well. And that is why when we distinguish between full frame and cropped sensor, we also need to talk about the equivalent focal length, meaning if you're shooting with a 35 millimeter lens, a 35 millimeter full frame lens on a cropped sensor camera, that lens automatically turns into a 50 millimeter lens, around a 50 millimeter lens and so on with all the other focal lens. Now, the factor, the multiplying factor for the equivalent focal lens depends on the camera brand. So Nikon has a 1.5 multiplying factor while Canon has a 1.6 multiplying factor. So if you have Nikon and if you have, let's say a 50 millimeter lens um, on a full frame Nikon, and you're using that 50 millimeter lens on a cropped sensor camera, that lens automatically turns into a 75 millimeter. Not optically, obviously that lens doesn't change, but since you're using a smaller portion, like a smaller sensor, basically you're using a smaller portion of whatever that lens can capture. So if you, for example, use a 35 millimeter cropped sensor lens on a full frame, you will get black edges around the frame because the sensor of the full frame is bigger. So there will be areas of the sensor that literally are black because the lens will have like shadows around. The sensor is bigger than what the lens can actually capture. So always be careful when you're choosing a lens for your camera to choose the right lens. You can use full frame lenses on cropped sensor cameras. Just you need to be aware of the difference in focal length. So if you buy a 35 millimeter, you need to know that if you have a sensor, a cropped sensor camera, then that lens will be a 50, will give you the same angle of view as a 50 millimeter lens. Why is this important? Um, because oftentimes, um, especially if you're a beginner, you will start with a beginner camera. And uh, beginner cameras often have cropped sensors. Only more professional cameras have full frame uh, sensors and they're more expensive, obviously. So if you're starting out, you will have a cropped sensor camera. Uh, but if you buy full frame lenses to use on your cropped sensor camera, what happens is that as your skills develop, you will eventually maybe buy a full frame camera, which means you don't have to rebuy all of your lenses. You will have the full frame uh, lenses already. While it's not, you can't do the other way around. So if you buy cropped sensor lenses, then when you upgrade your camera to a full frame, those lenses might not work on a full frame camera. So just, you know, food for thought. Now, another big distinction when we talk about lenses is prime lens versus zoom lenses. Now, each has pros and cons. Let's, let's have a look at those. So a prime lens is a lens with fixed focal length, 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter. These are all prime lenses. They 
offer better quality, often much better quality than zoom lenses, and they're often faster than uh, zoom lenses. Faster means that they have a maximum wide aperture. So prime lenses will often have a maximum wide aperture of 1.8, 1.4, 2.8. These are very wide apertures. And I have a class about the aperture. So have a look at that where I explain uh, the concept of aperture in more detail. So faster lenses have a maximum wide aperture, uh, bigger, very big, meaning they can capture a lot of light. Zoom lenses often um, have a smaller maximum apertures, meaning their maximum aperture often is 3.5, 5.6, these are beginner lenses, for example. Beginner lenses uh, often will have 3.5, 5.6 as a maximum aperture. The good thing about zoom lenses is their flexibility, because obviously a zoom lens is a lens that has a variable focal length, meaning you can go wider and then you can zoom in with the same lens. Uh, so they will give you flexibility and versatility but you will lose on quality and often you will lose on speed, meaning their, again, their maximum aperture is not gonna be as wide as a prime lens. And mainly is the quality, like you really lose on quality if you go for a, a zoom lens that is not a professional zoom lens. Because obviously there are professional zoom lenses that cost a lot of money, and um, they will uh, ensure a certain level of quality still, but obviously you have to invest a lot more money. While prime lenses are often a lot cheaper than uh, zoom lenses, and they will give you a much better quality. So personally, for food photography, I recommend going for prime lenses. Now, let's have a look at the four main lenses that are used in food photography and why. So we have the 35 millimeter lens, 1.8. This is the lens that I used to shoot this scene. Now, the 35 millimeter lens is a wide angle lens, as we said, meaning you can capture a wider scene. So it's great for spreads, as you can see. And it's great for flat lays as well, because flat lays, obviously your camera needs to be uh, parallel to the table or the floor. And if you have a wider angle, so if your lens is able to capture a wider scene, you don't need to be as far from the table or the floor. You can be closer to the table and capture a wider scene. So it is great for flat lays and it's great in small spaces. The downside, which is not really a downside, it's just something to be aware of, is that the wider the angle of view, the larger the depth of field. Again, there is a class on aperture and depth of field. So go have a look at that one if you want to learn more about depth of field and what it is. Just a quick recap, depth of field is the amount, like the portion of the image that it's in focus versus how much of the image is blurred. If you use a wider angle lens, like a 35 millimeter, the depth of field will be larger, meaning the portion of the image that is uh, sharp will be larger. So you will not have as much blur in the background. Again, this might not be a problem. For example, if you're shooting top down, a flat lace like this, you want the whole scene to be sharp. So you, that's, that's not really a problem. It's just something to be aware of. The, um, the wider the angle of view, the larger the depth of field. A good thing about the 35 millimeter lens, prime lens, is that it, it's budget friendly. It's one of those prime lenses that are great for food and that are not very expensive in photography terms. The nifty 50. <laughs> so the 50 millimeter 1.8, it's called the nifty 50. You will hear it everywhere in every food photography course, every food photography resource, uh, you will hear the Nifty 50 being mentioned a lot. Why? Because it's the most used lens for food photography 
ever. <laughs> like the 50 millimeter is the most used lens, not only for food photography, but in general for a lot of types of photography. Um, and it's got a history. It's one of the best lenses ever made because optically it's got the less distortion. So it's, it's a great lens for any photography genre. In food, it's specific, especially good because it's a very versatile and all round lens. You can capture stories with it. You can capture flat lace with it. It's great for 45 degree angles, eye levels, top down, everything. It's good for everything. And the best thing is that it's budget friendly. Like every camera brand has their own version of the 50 millimeter and pff, they're generally around 150 pounds or euros or dollars which in photography terms is very cheap for a lens so not only do you get great quality and a very fast lens but it's also like super cheap so it's a great 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 lens for beginners so if you're choosing your first camera or if you're choosing your first lens ditch the kit lens <laughs> do not buy the zoom <laughs> the kit zoom lens, that is crap, it's plastic. Get yourself a camera body and a 50 millimeter lens. That is the best pair that you can get as a beginner. Now, if you wanna step it up and if you want to get a lens that is more difficult to use, but that is a lot more uh, advanced, then the 100 millimeter macro is for you. <laughs> it's um, it's a bigger investment in terms of money and is a more difficult lens to uh, use. But if you find that you want to experiment with something new or that your skills are growing um, and you want to invest a little bit more money or, you know, Christmas, <laughs> then uh, uh, the 100 millimeter macro might be the right choice. So what is this lens good for? This lens is great <laughs> for capturing details and tight crops. So as you can see in this image of the blueberries, this is a very tight crop. Like I was very, very close to the blueberries in order to be able to capture them in such sharp details and like, you know, this big. Uh, the macro lens, the 100 millimeter macro lens is great for 45 degree angles or eye level angles. It's not recommended for, well, then again, maybe I'm lying. It's it's not that it's not recommended. It's just that it's more difficult to use in flat lays and overheads. Why? Because the 100 millimeter is a long focal length, meaning it's got a very close angle of view, meaning if you want to capture a bigger scene, then you have to be far away. Uh, you have to put physical distance between your subject and, and the lens and the camera if you want to capture a wider scene. So if you're doing a flat lay or an overhead again, and you're trying to shoot like just a bunch of blueberries, then it's great. You can totally do overhead. But if you want to do a, a, a wider overhead with like plates and props and napkins and stuff and things, maybe the macro is not the best solution for you because you're going to need to go very, very high above the ground or above your table. Uh, so it's generally more difficult to maneuver uh, this lens. Um, and it, uh, it does need a little bit more space to operate, as I mentioned, because if you don't want to go as tight in and as like cropped in, then you're going to have to uh, be further away. So you might have to have a little bit more space around your table and your shooting area. So that might not be a problem for you if you have a big kitchen or if you have a big studio, great. Then the macro is uh, like the 100 millimeter macro is perfect. Um, but if you're shooting in smaller spaces, then maybe the f start with a 50 millimeter because it might be a better choice for you. The 100 millimeter macro uh, is a little bit more difficult to operate as well because it's better to use it on a tripod. Why? Because... <laughs> And I talk about this in my shutter speed class, so check that out. The longer your focal length, the faster your shutter speed needs to be in order to capture a sharp image. So if you are shooting with a 100 millimeter macro, your shutter speed needs to be at least as fast as one over a hundred of a second. Anything slower than that and your photo will come out blurry. So in order to operate this lens, 
it's better for for you to be on a tripod unless you're shooting with flash or unless you're shooting with a lot of natural light uh, but otherwise um, you need to have a fast shutter speed to use this lens and get sharp images so it's recommended to use it on a tripod and another reason why uh, this lens is a little bit more advanced and a little bit more tricky to use is because even if you use the same aperture since it's a macro lens and since the focal length is longer you will have a shallow depth of field so as an example if you're shooting at f4 so at an aperture of four on a 50 millimeter lens or on a 100 millimeter lens the 100 millimeter lens the depth of field will be shallower even if you're using the same aperture because as i said the depth of field is also based on the focal length check out the aperture class if you want to learn more um, and yes it's a bigger investment it the, the macro lenses um, cost a little bit more and some brands won't have the 100 millimeter macro like i know that canon does nikon will have the 105 millimeter macro um so some brands will have you know a, a similar focal length uh that is a macro lens another one of my favorite okay so know how i mentioned uh zoom lenses that are also good and fast this is one of those and this is the best zoom lens for food photography. So if you want a zoom lens for your food photography, this is the one you should get to start. It's an expensive lens um, and it's big and heavy, but I absolutely love it. Why? Because it's versatile and it's so flexible. So it's a great lens when you need flexibility. For example, if you're shooting in restaurants or if you're traveling or if you're shooting some kind of events like weddings and you want to go from shooting like a wider spread of the beautiful table to close ups of the cake or close ups of, I don't know, just like the plate of food. So this lens is basically an, an, an all in one lens. It will allow you to shoot wide cropped everything. So that's why I invested some money into it because I shoot a lot of food travel photography, meaning I'm out and about a lot. I shoot in restaurants a lot and therefore I need the flexibility that this lens provides. Oftentimes I can't shoot with my 100 millimeter macro out and about because it's so tricky to maneuver of, because of all the reasons that we, we saw before. Um, and sometimes the 50 millimeter won't be as versatile as I need it to be. So this is a great lens for uh, restaurant photography, for example. The maximum aperture of this lens is 2.8, which is great for a zoom lens. Uh, and that's why it's so expensive. And that's why it's so big and heavy because the maximum aperture is 2.8 whether you're shooting at 24 or at 70 and that is a great thing about this lens cheaper zoom lenses for example the kit lens the 18 to 55 millimeter cheaper zoom lenses will have different maximum aperture at different focal lengths so if at 18 your maximum aperture will be 3.5 if you're shooting at 55, it will be 5.6. So there's a loss of light. The more you zoom in, the closer your aperture, the less light you're able to capture. And the larger the depth of field as well. So you won't get as much blur and as much, you know, beautiful bokeh. Um, while with this lens, if I'm shooting at 70 millimeter and f2.8, like in this image here, for example, this was shot at 70 millimeter and at 2.8, so wide open. Look how soft and blurry my background is. It's, it's lovely. I absolutely love this lens, I could swear by it. But yes, you need a little bit more uh, money for it. So again, either if you want to go a bit more pro or Christmas.
Ah, one important thing to say about uh, zoom lenses that I already mentioned is the loss in optical quality. So if you go for a zoom lens, even this lens, which is professional and expensive, the, there's still a little bit of loss in optical quality. So if I shoot the same image with this lens or with the 50 millimeter lens, the 50 millimeter lens has still better quality. However, for what I need it for, the quality in this professional zoom lens is just perfect. So again, it depends. Uh, the loss in optical quality it's not necessarily, you know, a problem. It depends what you're going to use the image for. Are third party lenses good enough for food photography? Uh, the answer is generally yes. There are third party lenses like Tamron and Sigma that uh, obviously cost a, um, sometimes a lot less than uh, brand lenses. Um, and they're as valid as brand lenses. And it again, it all depends on your needs and the final usage of the images. If you're shooting for advertising and your image needs to be printed on huge billboards all over the world, then you'd really wanna focus on quality. But if you're shooting for your social media or your blog and your image is only going to be displayed in a smaller size on web, it's not going to be printed anywhere, then uh, maybe you can compromise a little bit on quality to save some money so that you can buy yourself a flash or another piece of equipment or upgrade your camera body or, you know, whatever reason. Um, so these lenses are budget friendly and some of them you don't even compromise on quality because they're as good as brand lenses. Obviously, when, when you're in doubt, the internet is your friend. Do some research because there are lots and lots of websites that do visual comparison between each of the lenses. For example, if you want to get yourself a 50 millimeter lens, just go Google 50 millimeter Tamron versus Nikon or Tamron versus uh, Canon or Sigma versus Canon, whatever. And then you will be able to see in detail reviews of both lenses and see the difference in sharpness, the difference in like, you know, distortion, all of the techy, <laughs> the techy stuff um, that if you're a beginner, you might not even like care about too much. So have a look at those because some of the third party lenses are as valid as brand lenses. Also, sometimes you might not have a choice. For example, in uh, Nikon doesn't have a 100 millimeter macro. They have the 105 millimeter macro. So uh, what I did once was I bought the 90 millimeter macro from Tamron, which is a super great lens. So sometimes these third party uh, brands have focal lengths that your main brand won't have. So they will offer different options for your lenses and that's just what you might want. You never know. So that's all about this topic. See you next time. Ciao!